Hello, those viewing us in the future. I've already said hello to all these people. Um, it is semester two, 2023. This is a revision seminar for Maths 1B. Um, and here we are. Uh, I would like to remind you um, and you watching, I am not part of the School of Maths and Computer Science or possibly Computer Science and Maths. I can never remember which way the order is because I'm not part of it. Um, I am part of the Maths Learning Center, which belongs to the whole university. So I have no control or decision-making processes. I'm not part of any of the decision-making processes um, to do with your assessment. I have not seen the exam. I never see the exam. All I can give you is my experience from helping people in the Maths Learning Center for the last 15 years. But I don't know what they're gonna give you. So any advice I have about the exam is based on general generic thoughts. It is not, I'm not keeping a secret from you what I know is in the exam because I just don't know. Just wanted to point that out now so that we're all, all on the same page with that. Okay, let's just talk about Taylor um, polynomials and series. Here's our brainstorm. Things in Taylor Polynomials Taylor series that are on your mind. Sorry? Um, it is always okay while we do this to add on to something that someone else said as well. Sorry? No. Sigma meaning some notation. Yep. Ah. Kind of interesting you mention it here because it's not, a, you know, usually officially part of people's minds when they're thinking Taylor polynomials and series, but it is there. Yep. Mm. Maybe there's no E in that. Yep. I think we've got plenty of useful thoughts there. Thank you, that's really helpful. Does anyone want to add anything else? Cool. All right, I'm going to think for a moment about what you've told me. So be ready in a moment. Okay, well, here we go. Ah.
Okay. So, glad someone mentioned the sum notation versus expanded notation. That's a very interesting thing that's worth pointing out that I would not have mentioned explicitly unless someone asked. Um, <clears throat> right. I can start with the con conceptualizing it. And I'll probably come back and forth to that as I go. So let's see. And it goes with the estimating as well. Um, there's all these different things that are all go together into Taylor polynomials and Taylor series, which is why it's at the end of Mass 1B instead of earlier. Um, and uh, hmm. I'm just going to write down some things and I might come back and fix it later. But the idea of a Taylor polynomial or series is to write um, the function you're thinking of a different way. Um, and in particular, to write it as a polynomial if you can. And the reason we care about that is because polynomials are really nice. They're the first functions that people thought were functions when they were creating the concepts in mathematics. Um, the reason order of operations works the way it does is because people wanted to try to write polynomials. Like polynomials are the reason a lot of stuff exists in mathematics. So polynomials are awesome. They tend to look like this. Something plus something x plus something x squared plus, you know, and then there's a last one somewhere. Um, and when people introduce polynomials, they often write them the other way around with the, this one at the front. Um, and this is called the leading term, which is why some people write it at the front. But it's called the leading term because it leads the graph. The direction that the graph goes at the two ends is based on this term. Um, so it leads the shape of the graph follows this term. Um, that's why it's called the leading term, not because it's the first one. Um, anyway, that's worth noting. Um, and the thing that's really cool about polynomials for the usefulness of drawing other functions, well, there's lots of cool things about polynomials. Polynomials are just really well known. I mean, you know, you can factorize them theoretically. Um, you can um, know that they're nice and smooth. I don't have any bend kinks or bends in them. Uh, they have neat little turning points that you can find with derivatives. It's all very pleasant. Um, and they're quite easy to program a computer to calculate because um, computers know how to do multiplication um, and addition. Um, and it's really quite difficult to program a computer to calculate, say, ln of x. Um, but you can easily program a computer to do a polynomial. Even better, you don't even need for it to know how to do powers um, because what you can do is you can say, a n um, and then times that by x and then add the next one and times all of that by x and add the next one times all of that by x and add the next one and times all of that by x and so in the end all you're doing is multiplying which is very cool um yeah so anyway polynomials are great everyone loves polynomials they're the best and uh, one of the nice things about polynomials is that they have these nice wiggly bits right and lots of functions do have wiggly bits like sine and cos for example I mean, if you're only looking at a small piece of your function, it may be possible to write a polynomial that fits it quite neatly in that zone. That's the idea behind it. So maybe I'm imagining sine of x, which looks like this. And maybe if I was only looking at, say, this bit here, I might think, oh yeah, if I was only looking at that bit, maybe there's a cubic function that's pretty good at approximating sine. Maybe. Because cubics sort of look like that. Um, it could be a pair of five or something else like that, but maybe it's about the right shape to fit into that zone. That'd be, that'd be sweet. Um, and if I wanted to go further, 
then maybe I'd need a, a you know, one, two, three, a quintic or something to be able to fit into that space. So that's one of the ideas um, of the tail of polynomials. Cool. Sine is, of course, not a polynomial, like deeply not. Um, but it might be good enough to approximate with a polynomial as long as you were close to the middle. Um, and that'd be that'd be great. And so that's what the idea of a Taylor polynomial and a Taylor series is, is to say, well, if I'm close enough to a particular spot, maybe polynomials pretty good. And then all that stuff with errors is figuring out how good is the pretty good or how bad could it be? Yeah, so. Okay, that's the general idea. How do people feel about the vibe there? Okay. Um, problem is, of course, out of all of the possible polynomials that you could possibly think of, which one is the best one to pick? How do you choose? And our friends Taylor and McLaurin figured out that well, if you want it to be really close, then what you could do is you could make it match at at least one point. I'm sure the lecturer talked about all of this in the videos, but anyway, we're doing it again live today because now you can ask questions as we go. Oh, I didn't mention earlier, it is okay to interrupt me. Um, maybe not multiple times within the one sentence, but... Um, Whatever, if it's something's on your mind that I'm talking about, please ask. Um, this is your revision seminar. I will attempt to stop every five to 10 minutes to give you a chance to ask questions, um, but it's always okay to interrupt. Okay, back to it. So if you've got some weird function and here you are at this spot, maybe not there, here, and you would like a polynomial that matches that, what we're going to do is we're going to make the polynomial match at this point, the correct function value. And we're also going to make it have the correct slope. And we're also going to make it have the correct concavity. And basically what we're going to do is make a polynomial that matches the function value and the first derivative and the second derivative and as many derivatives as we hope for at this spot. And the more derivatives that it matches, the better chance it will have of being close further away from this. Because the derivatives, thank you, because the derivatives control how quickly your function changes. And so as you move away from this point, if the derivatives match, it will change at the same speed as the original function and so it should follow this approximately the same curve. Yes. Well, an infinite series of like a Taylor polynomial will have a zero error. Or... Yep. Will an infinite series of a Taylor polynomial have a zero error? The answer is yes, it will have a zero error. Um, if the infinite series exists at all. So some functions don't have an infinite one that that has an interval of convergence that is reasonable. So, but yes, you're right. And the most famous ones are sine and cos and e to the power of x. They have Taylor series that go on forever that are exactly equal to them if you are capable of going forever. But you've been used to going forever as a concept. Like when you, you know, 0 0.3333333 forever is exactly a third. But if you stop writing threes at any point, it's not actually equal to a third ever if you stop. You have, yeah, so it's not different to that idea fundamentally. Okay, so that's the idea. We make the derivatives match. And it turns out that if you make the derivatives match, then these coefficients here will be based on the derivatives of your function. It's very cool. So it turns out that if you have a function f of x 
which is whatever the crazy crap it is. Um, and you want a polynomial p of x that's close. If p of x has these coefficients, up to some point, then the correct choice for the coefficients is that the zeroth coefficient, the constant term, uh, hmm, damn it, I'm gonna need a function value, but I have to pick a spot to calculate that function value at. And that is called the center usually. So when someone said centering it, you've got to pick a center. You've got to pick a point at which it's going to match all those derivatives. Um, yeah. You get to choose what it is. Actually, you don't. Most of the time in exams, they tell you what it is. Um, but and that's just under the philosophy that if you can do it for any number, you can do it for whichever one you actually want. But the most common choice for C is zero. Yeah. So you pick your C, and that's the center. And the constant term has to be C. Oh, crap ass. Just a second. I rescind what I just said. Wait, just stop. If I want to write my polynomial this way, I have to pick zero as my center. So here we go. And the reason I've chosen this is because if I sub x equals zero into all of this, it disappears and I just get a norm. And that's the same as what I get when I sub f of zero into this, should be the same answer as what I get when I sub f of um, x equals zero into this, which is a norm. And so a norm has to be whatever I get when I sub zero into this. And a one, comes out to this because watch this if i differentiate this polynomial that'll go away i'll get a1 i'll get 2a2x actually just a second let me write this out p dashed of x is a1 plus 2a2x plus 3a3x cubed and so on forever and if i sub zero into this i get a1 and if I sub zero into f dashed, I get f dashed of zero. And so a one has to be f dashed of zero. And this is the entire reasoning of how Taylor polynomials work. And a two, if I differentiate this again, I'll get two lots of a two x. No, there won't be an x anymore. And three times two a three x and so on. And so I'll get f dashed of zero, but it's twice as big as it should be. So I have to divide by two. And then I'll get a3 is the third derivative at zero, but I'll have to divide by three times two because those are the numbers that came out when I did the, all the derivatives along the way. And that's why you end up with a factorial on the bottom because every time you differentiate by something, the power, the exponent will come down and multiply and you'll get a string of different numbers all multiplied together, which is what the factorial does. And so you end up at the end with the nth derivative with zero subbed in on n factorial. And that is the correct number that goes in these spots. If you're lucky, your function here has a neat little formula for every derivative that you can figure out from the pattern that you've got there. And then you can find a formula for what this turns out to be. If you're unlucky, there is no formula for this and you just have to figure it out as you go. But if you're lucky, there'll be a formula for what this answer is for different ends. And sine and cos and e to the x all have those formulas. So very nice. So that's great. Lovely. If you want to write your polynomial as a traditional polynomial like this, that's excellent. And this is called a Maclaurin polynomial because Maclaurin did this first before Taylor did his stuff. Or I think possibly at the same time. I think it was at the same time. Anyway, it was a couple of hundred years ago. I don't know. Probably 50 years doesn't make that much of a difference in the grand scheme of things. Um, yep. Um, I don't know if I read, I think, like, the, um, like the 
slope or your or your x squared sort of thing. Basically, what's happening is that you're adding up of the rest of point, and then the x term is just a total random and then x squared is a time Yeah. So I'm just trying to figure out why adding it helps to define the polynomial. So why does adding extra curviness, like extra derivatives, help to define the correct position? Um, let's see if we can figure that out. That's a really good question. Yeah. So um, your intuition stops being useful after the after the second derivative because it's like, well, our cubics don't feel all that different from other things. Each derivative tells you how quickly the previous derivative is changing. So the third derivative tells you how quickly the second derivative changes. And the second derivative how quick tells you how quickly the first derivative changes. And the first derivative tells you how quickly the function value is changing. And so if you've got a function that is the correct answer at this point here, and you know what the slope is, then a good guess for what this point is, is that if you make a delta x, and this is the slope m, then this distance here should be m times delta x, right? And that's a good guess for what this function value is going to be. But all that uses is the first derivative. If you've got the second derivative, you know how quickly this changes as you move along. And so you could get a better guess for how much of a difference this makes. Because it's not m all the way along, it's m here and m and a bit here and m and a bit here and m and a bit here. And so you can cut your delta x into several pieces and have a different slope on each bit and figure out a better guess as to what the point is over here. And if you've got the second, the th third derivative, then you can cut it into even smaller pieces and make and know that the second derivative causes the first derivative to change. The third derivative causes the second derivative to change differently, which causes the first derivative to change even more differently. And you can have a better guess as to what the function is doing in this zone. How does that help? Yeah. Yep. Um, if we have, for example, a function like PBA, mm -hmm. uh, it has an infinite series. Right? Mm -hmm. If we take the, the fifth value of that, we will get an approximation, but not the actual value. Correct. Um, if we have a different function that, for example, its fifth derivative is zero, mm -hmm. uh, I know this is a super practical application, but would you get the equivalent actual value of that function? You, just... you would indeed. In fact, let's do that. Ready? This is my f of x. That's my f of x. Now that really is a polynomial, but uh, currently it doesn't. I mean, it's a bit it's weird. F dash of x is oh man, really shouldn't have made it so complicated for myself. Uh, we'll we'll uh, keep all of this and differentiate that. And then we'll um, keep those two and differentiate the middle which is one and then we'll keep those two and differentiate the first one which is also one and that's my first derivative yay cool sure Oh, crap. Yeah. Good, good catch. Thank you. I always say I would like to have someone watching over my shoulder during an exam to catch these things for me. That'd be great. <laughs> All you can do is be that person for yourself 10 minutes later. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't like it. I'm 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 not a fan at this time. Yeah, I've I've got it. I've got it. It'll be fine. Uh, so I'll keep these. 
and differentiate this. And then I'll keep, so I kept those ones. I'll keep uh, those ones. And differentiate this, which is one. And I'll keep those ones. No, just a second. Oh man, oh, it's just gonna, it's so bad. No, I give up. Okay, just a second, wait. Let's do a simpler one, ready? Um, I'm gonna change that three to something where it's easier to see what's going on, that's okay. We've got six, uh, x plus five, and f triple dashed is six, and f four is zero, and then f five, and then everything forever is zero. Okay, so if I make the Taylor series for this, Taylor polynomial for this, all right, well, I'm gonna to need to know that the, the Maclaurin polynomial will put in zero for everything. So I'll get five cubed, which is 125. I'll get um, three times five squared, which is 75. I'll get six times five, which is 30. And then all the rest of them are zero, right? That's not a six, that's a six, okay. So I'm gonna use those numbers to figure out the correct coefficients um, if I had more room, I could, or possibly, I really should. Um, I would normally write down the coefficients separately, um, but you can attempt to do them all at once if you like. So my coefficients, no, I'm just going to do it. So my coefficients are 125 for the constant, 75 for x. Um, actually, do you know what? Look, I'm just writing it anyway. 30 divided by 2 for x squared. Um, 6 divided by 3 factorial, which is 6 for x cubed. And then all the rest of them are 0, right? Forever. That's my Taylor polynomial, my Maclaurin polynomial. This is what you would get if you expanded it out. I would not recommend doing Taylor polynomials as a method of expanding out polynomials. But... It's the truth. This is exactly what this polynomial is as a traditional ordinary polynomial. Yay. So you asked, would it be exact? Well, it is if it's already a polynomial. If it's not a polynomial, it'll never be exact. But if it is a polynomial, it will be. Cool. Okay, so we're going to just make sure I don't lose my page numbers. And then we're going to do a thing. So here's, here's the thing. This will match exactly. So for a polynomial, it'll work everywhere. It'd be great if you go far enough. For a um, thing that isn't a polynomial, it'll only match exactly at the center at zero so far. And maybe I'd like it to match exactly somewhere else. But I know exactly how to make something be the correct answer when x is c. And that's to make sure that when you sub in x equals c, you get zero. And so what you can do is just put x minus c everywhere there's an x. And that will put it at a different center. So for a Taylor polynomial, then to C, it looks more like this. Like that. Because what that means is if I sub in x equals c, then c minus c is 0, c minus c is 0, c minus c is 0, and I get a naught. And works for the derivatives as well. 
And then neatly, the derivative of x minus c squared is just 2x minus c because of the chain rule. The derivative of that's 1. It all works out nicely. It's great. And so you can make it have any center you want by just doing that. But the rule is the same. A n is still the nth derivative, but this time you sub in the position c instead of 0. It is exactly the same. Yep. Are you ready? This is already a Taylor polynomial for this function with center minus 5. It's just that all the other coefficients are zero. So if you, this is this is quite ridiculous, but I'm going to do it anyway. What if you saw this polynomial in the wild? And you wanted to know, for no reason in particular, what its Taylor polynomial was with center minus five. Taylor polynomial degree three center minus five. Okay, so f dash of x is seventy five plus thirty x plus three x squared, and f double dash of x is so is thirty plus six x, and f triple dash of x is six and f dash f of zero f of minus five is oh this is why we have calculators but imagine you were taylor three to four hundred years ago and don't have calculators this is why he invented taylor series right i can do it i can do it 125, uh, 75 times 5. Oh, yeah. No. No. 6. Really? Oh, yeah. Cool. Thank you. I believe it. Only it will be a minus because of the minus 5. And 15 times 5 squared is also 375. And that's minus 125 because the minus comes out of the cube and we get zero. Yay. And F dashed of minus five. I am slightly distressed. Have I done my answer wrong? Yeah, yeah, that's 75 there, that's minus 150 there, and that's 75 there, and they all cancel out and I get zero, that's great. And if double dash to minus 5 is 30 plus 6 times minus 5, which is also zero, and if triple dash to minus 5, well, that's always 6 no matter what you sub into it. And so my Taylor polynomial is 0 plus 0x zero plus 0 on 2x squared plus 6 on 3 factorial, which is 6 cubed. Only they're not x's, they're x minus x minus minus fives, right? Because that's the center. I got too excited. And so I end up with x plus five cubed. Woo! -hoo! So how to complete the cube? Figure out the correct center and do a Taylor polynomial. <laughs> mm. um, knowing what the correct center is might be a bit tricky. Um, yeah. Yay. <laughs> and you said something about Pascal's triangle there. It is Pascal's triangle. Pascal's triangle is full of um, chooses, and chooses are calculated with factorials, and factorials come about when you do Taylor polynomials. Yay, everything's connected. Um, one could consider it all to have a mystical significance if you wanted.
Um, it's so that when you sub in C, the C minus C cancel that give you zero. Plus. So I'm just going to repeat that because that's really important. Because we wanted to center at minus five and that produced an X plus five when we did it. And you do that so that when you sub in minus five, it cancels out to be zero. Well, that was fun. Um, so, you know, don't um, recreate the wheel in your exam and do tail polynomials to do polynomials, but understanding that it works for polynomials is what made people want to do it for things that weren't. That's the idea. So um, back in the day, like several hundred years ago, polynomials were the only functions that people thought there were. And so they just pretended everything was. And we are going back to that when we do tail polynomials. We just go, well, I'm just going to pretend it is a polynomial because I know that if I did this process to a polynomial, it would give me the correct answer. So I'll do it to whatever function I want. Yay. So for e to the x, because the derivative of e to the x is always the same, forever. And so because when you sub in zero, you'll just get one for everything. Every coefficient will be one on n factorial when you do the Maclaurin polynomial. So you'll get a n is f n zero on n factorial, but this is always one. So here is where we can talk about the difference um, between the sum notation and the regular adding notation. If you have a formula for what every term is going to be, then you can use sum notation. So this is the um, Maclaurin polynomial. Well, I'm being really sloppy here. When you say a Taylor polynomial, that's when it stops at some point. Um, a Taylor series goes forever. That's the difference between them. Taylor polynomial, uh, Maclaurin polynomial or a Taylor polynomial stops at some highest power and the Taylor series or a Maclaurin series, they go forever. Yes, it's a polynomial with no last term, but it's not technically a polynomial because the official definition of polynomial is one that stops. Um, for there are reasons why that's the definition. So, yeah. And if you did a Maclaurin series on a Taylor polyn on a, on a original polynomial, it would be a polynomial because all the mo other ones are zero. So it's technicality. Anyway, I would try and make a Taylor series for this, and I would get one on one factorial and one on two factorial. Sorry, one on zero factorial, one on one factorial times x, one on two factorial times x squared, one on three factorial times x cubed forever. And we define zero factorial to be one just so that we don't have to, just so that the formula works, basically. There are other reasons to define zero factorial to be one, but you know, we just define it to be one so that we can write this formula. Yay. Because anything to the power of zero is one, and so this is x to the power of zero here. That's great. And this is the series version, the sum notation version of the Maclaurin series. Or e to the x. But if you stop at any point, if you went just from zero up to five, that would be the fifth Maclaurin polynomial for e to the x. Um, yeah. The cool thing is, is that if you have something that you know what its Maclaurin series is, you can theoretically use that to figure out what its derivative is at a particular spot, which is um, Anyway, you can do it backwards. Um, yeah, anyway, this is what it is. And I believe this is approximately how your calculator figures out what e to the something is using a Taylor polynomial of a certain degree. I could be wrong. It's probably got something slightly more efficient than that. Um, but yeah, 
It's a pretty good approximation. In fact, in some places in the world, the and when they teach school kids the definition of what E is, they define E to be the sum of one over n factorial. Cool. Seems a bit too mystifying to me to, to see it at high school, but anyway, um, yeah. It's just like some people define ln of x to be the integral from 1 to x of 1 over t dt. Um, you can choose it to be that rather than the inverse of e to the x and then define e to the x to be the inverse of ln. Um, that's how they did it to me in my first year at uni. I kind of like it, but anyway. Um, could be Stockholm syndrome, though. Um, so... Um, that is the Taylor polynomial. So really, you're actually allowed to say that e to the x is literally equal to this. For every possible x, this is the truth. It will get closer to the correct answer faster for x's that are smaller. Um, yeah. Because if x is like 10, you have to go quite a long way to get to be, to be close to e to the power of 10 like a quite many terms. But if X is like a half, you won't have to go very far to be quite close to the answer. So the closer X is to the center, and this is a Maclaurin polynomial, and you can tell it is because it says X instead of X minus something else. Um, the closer you are to zero, the better this works for us without going forever. So, yeah. It's time for me to stop talking for a couple of moments and let people process, ask questions if you've got them. Something like this. For example, just randomly as a, you know, one that I saw yesterday. Um, so write down the Taylor series centers. Oh, that should be a capital, it's a person's name. Um, center zero for f of x equals x squared e to the two x. So the command write down, now we're into we're into how to respond to people asking me to do stuff, which is a different game to just mathematics. The command write down says um, it has to be able to be written down, which means some notation, because that will cover all of the answers forever if you write some notation. But if you write it with pluses, you technically haven't written the whole thing down if you stop, even if you've got a dot, 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 because the person reading it won't necessarily know what the rest of the terms are if you put a dot, dot, dot. So my instinct would be that if you're asked to write, to write down a Taylor series, which goes forever, the only way to write something down that goes forever is to write an infinite sum. I will actually finish this question in a moment. Okay, so and the fact that you can write it down means that there is a lot less working than you would normally do for doing it but for by first principles. Write down also is is a clue that means that they want you to show less working than it would take by first principles. So I would say that we should write it down based on using this formula. So I know that e to the x is this. And so e to the 2x should have a 2x where the x is in this. Like that. And so that would be that. 
and x squared e to the 2x would be multiplying this by x squared, and that would make this go up by 2. Ta-da! Done. It's a perfectly good Taylor series. If it makes you feel uncomfortable to have an n plus 2 here instead of an n there, because traditionally it's x to the n, well, you can shift everything down a bit. Like putting in 0 here We really need to buy new document cameras. We bought them in 2020. They got a lot of use in that year. Um, but yes, I know. Stop telling me about the audio quality. There's an X. Okay. So if you put zero in here for N, then it really starts at two, right? Putting zero for n gives me a two. Putting one for n gives me a three. Putting three for n gives me a gives me a five. And so this is the same as starting at two. Mm -hmm. If that makes you feel better, yeah, it makes me feel worse. But you know, it's worth a try. <laughs> Both of them are okay. Um, but that process of putting all of these up by two and making all of these ends go down by two, that compensating thing, um, they call that an um, index shifting, in case you're wondering. Yes, I multiplied by x squared, and if you times by x squared, you've got n plus two, you add the exponents, and so it became an x plus two. I really should have put that working in separately. Sorry about that. Okay. And so just to make sure that we've got this thing, your final answer would be the Taylor series is. Yeah. So I just want to do a little extension question, like part B. What is F4 um, of zero? What is the fourth derivative of this function with zero subbed in? I don't have to find the fourth derivative because I know that the fourth derivative at zero divided by four factorial will be the coefficient of x to the power of four. So the coefficient of x to the power of four is f four zero divided by four factorial. But the coefficient of x power of 4 is um, 2 to the power of 4 minus 2 um, on 4 minus 2 factorial, according to this formula here. n equals 4, sub it in. That's my answer. And that is 2 squared over 2 factorial. And 2 squared um, is 4 divided by 2, which is 2. And so therefore, f4, 0 over 4 factorial is 2. And therefore, f4, 0 is 2 times 4 factorial. And 4 factorial is 24, so that's 48. Yay! This would say, if I were writing this exam, which I'm not, That'd be a fun little question to stick in. Yeah, be great. If I use this form, I would have to say I need this to be a four, which means I need to put n equals two into this formula. Oh. So the so event. X, uh, the so the advantage of this formula is if I'm looking for x to the power of 4, I can just sub n equals 4. This formula looks prettier, but if I'm looking for x to the power of 4, I need to put n equals 2 to make it come out to 4. And it'll come out to the same answer. 
Yay. So if you know the Taylor polynomial of something, then you can at least figure out the derivatives at one point. Yep. I'm going to see if I can process that. So you said I've already got this sum notation thing. Right. So this sum notation thing tells me for every possible power of x what the coefficient's going to be. So it's essentially a formula. Um, I could have written um, the tail polynomial is, oh, no. <laughs> Luckily, I actually brought it this time. There have been revision seminars where I haven't brought the power cord and I've um, had to run off to find it. Bing. All right. I could have written this. just want to say, I could have written... Taylor polynomial is f of x equals a naught plus a one x plus a n not polynomial Taylor series. Plus a two x squared plus forever where a n is uh, um is two to the n minus two on n minus 2 factorial. Oh, crap, but it doesn't start till x squared, sorry. I could have written that. a2x squared plus a3x cubed plus forever. As my answer, that would have been a perfectly good answer without using sum notation. So the sum notation isn't really telling me anything different from that. It's just telling me what the coefficients are of x to the power of whatever. So this is like a backwards sort of question. It's saying, well, if I were to try and figure out what this Taylor series was from first principles, I would figure out what that coefficient was by doing the fourth derivative and subbing in zero and dividing by four factorial. But I already know that if I do this calculation instead, it tells me the coefficient as well. And so that's why I did it the way I did it. Ah. The coefficient is 2. That is 100% correct. So when I put n equals 4 into this, I get 2 as the coefficient of x to the power of 4. But the way you figure out that coefficient is to do the fourth derivative and divide by n factorial. Yep. <laughs> Well, I mean, you don't. But what I was saying is that if you did find the fourth derivative of this and subbed in zero and subbed in zero and divided by four factorial, you would get the correct coefficient of x to the power of four. But I also know that the correct power of coefficient of x to the power of four is this. This has been calculated already to include all those fourth derivative things and the four factorial on the bottom. It's just that some parts of the four factorial have canceled out and left me with the two factorial. Yeah. I feel like I'm not getting there. We, we, we may, I may come back to it later. Um, and it may be the cause of the problem is that there are factorials in both of these formulas. Is that what's bothering you? There are factorials in both of these formulas. It's just that the factorials of different numbers. So F4, 0 divided by 4 factorial, and this one has something else divided by 2 factorial. And I just happen to know that they happen to work out to be the same thing. Yeah. OK. It's tricky. The worst thing about this is if you stop to think about it any moment, you suddenly feel like you don't understand it anymore. 
Um, that's okay. It's a common feeling. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, that's okay. As long as I don't explicitly tell you to do it by first principles or something. You say, use the definition of a Taylor polynomial to calculate this, then you'd have to do all the derivatives. Yeah. And it can get really difficult to figure out what the formula is. Like if I had times that by x plus one, that would have been a bit trickier um, because I would have had to line up the, the x's and the ones and join them together and that would have been harder. So, yeah. Ooh. So if I do a Taylor with center minus one on that, All right, here we go. If I want a Taylor series, center minus one. Now I know the Maclaurin series, which has center zero. But if I want center minus one, it needs to have an X plus one in it. That was based on your comment earlier. It'll be X minus minus one. And that is got what? I would really prefer it to be this. That would be great, right? Because then that would look like this. And that would have center minus one, but it's a whole different function. Nothing up my sleeves. e to the x plus 1 is e times e to the x, because that's e to the 1 times e to the x. And divide both sides by e. Oh, yay! And now if I multiply by x plus 1, I have no idea. They may not give... This is probably not the sort of thing they'd do to you in an exam, but I thought it was fun. What's that? Ah, oh, did they? And yay, look at that, it's beautiful. So the goal here is to write an infinite series with an x plus one to the power of something in it. And so I thought, well, I'm not going to, if I put an x plus one in that spot there, x plus one minus one, expanding that out with an n in it, it's going to be just awful. So let's just put an x plus one there and factorize it on this side instead. Yeah. So my expectation is that that is not an exam level question, but who knows? Like, I don't know the sort of psychopaths that you have um, writing your exams. They're probably nice people. I like most of them. Um, <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> So I like most of them, they're, they're, you know. And to be fair, most lecturers don't want to write too complicated questions because then it makes their life complicated when they mark the thing. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> no control over the economics lecturers. They tend to do weird ass crap, but math lecturers are, <laughs> math lecturers are a little nicer. Um, but the point of this is like, if you can do this, you can do anything. And the th sort of thing that I just did where I went, huh, I wonder if that would work and trying it out, allow me to practice some of the things that I need to be able to do anyway. And playing around with ideas like that is a good thing um, outside of your
And if you're in the exam, well, play around with it anyway because you haven't got any other choice. <laughs> so it's a good thing to do every so often to play around with those ideas. Um, I'm a big expert for play, which is basically what would happen if or and how would this turn out? If you've been in the Math Learning Centre since August, since book week, you've seen on my back wall my thoughts about play. Um, go look at the sheep um, at some point. Um, I wrote a picture book for book week based on Mem Fox and Julie Horacek's Where is the Green Sheep? Um, but it's about maths, so you should go have a look at it. Anyway, that's that. What time are we at? Oh, wow. Okay, cool. How are people feeling? Error term. Okay, cool. Want me to talk about that? Cool. Just let's check off on our list as well. The first steps. I know I did it for polynomials. But the process is the same. If you are going to figure out a Taylor series or a Taylor polynomial for um, a specific thing, I recommend writing all the derivatives down, writing all the sub them in, and then creating the coefficients. That's a useful way of organizing your life if you're going to do it via the derivatives. Um, so someone did ask about first steps in getting going. That's what I've got. And you're right, it is a bunch of derivatives. If you're going, if someone asks you to figure out a Taylor polynomial from scratch using the definition, write down all the derivatives you need, write down all the answers when you sub in the center, and then write down the coefficients. That's usually the best plan. Okay. <laughs> Error. Okay, so we said right at the beginning, polynomials are great, but most functions aren't polynomials. And so when you attempt to write them as a polynomial, if you're going to have to stop at some point calculating this because no one can calculate them forever, how bad would it be? So if you stop calculating your, your infinite series at the, you know, x to the 10, how close to the value will you be for the particular x you're thinking of? That's the question that we want to know. The thing is that each x will have its own error. So we've got some wicked thing. No, I'm going to draw the polynomial first. I don't know how to draw things that aren't polynomials. That's a tail polynomial. Suppose I was using it to, to estimate, say, this thing. So that's my f of x there. That's my p3. I didn't use this notation earlier, but putting a little 3 at the bottom indicates to people that you've only gone to x to the power of 3. So I'm going to draw them in different colors. Okay. Can everyone distinguish between those colors? Good. If you can't, I apologize. I'm usually quite aware of it. Nicholas, the other mass learning center, center lecturer is red, green, colorblind. So I'm usually quite aware of that. Um, but he can't see red at all. Um, yeah, it's rather interesting. So yeah, this thing just here on the screen, it says stop share is black for him. So. There you go. Okay, so the thing is it's quite close about here. Um, and for different x's, there'll be different amount of error. So in order to figure out f of x, you would have to do over this side the Taylor polynomial minus a bit. And that bit gets bigger and bigger the further we go. And over this side, we'd have to do the Taylor polynomial plus a bit. So the error is how much you have to add to this to get 
the function you're thinking of. So f of x is p3x plus, now, did I use an r or an e for the error? Hmm? I will get to that in a second. Um, if you look at really um, older revision seminars, they use an R, it's called the remainder. Um, and if you look online for Taylor's error theorem, it will often say an R instead of an E, because the R stands for remainder, by the way, um, which is the bit left over after you've removed the P of three. So, so this is always true. So there is some function here that tells you how far apart the polynomial is from the actual function. Problem is, you don't know. Like imagine being Taylor in whenever it was, um, and you've got e to the x, which you can't calculate, and you've got a Taylor polynomial, which you can, it's, it's great, um, but you can't figure out what the error is because you don't know what e is. His theorem is supremely clever. Like, Yep, I can't figure out what the error is, but I can figure out that it can't be any worse than this. That's how the theorem works. So the theorem goes like this, that this third Taylor, this error here, well, just, just wait one moment, okay. So if it really is equal to its proper infinite Taylor series, so you've got like A0 plus A1x, plus a2x squared, plus a3x cubed, plus a4x to the four, plus forever. All right. And my Taylor polynomial is just this bit. And then it stops. But there's nothing stopping. I could have gone forever. This bit here, that's the error. All of the rest of that bit that goes forever, that's the error. And what Taylor figured out was that what you could do is you could do a4x to the 4, but just use a different x, and it would come out to the right answer. So instead of trying to figure out what all of this is, he went, well, if I just use the next one and just make my x a bit bigger, or a bit smaller, then it'll cover all that other crap that's missing. That's what Taylor did. So we stop here. And so the error is definitely all of this stuff, a4x to the four plus a5x to the five plus forever. And what Taylor figured out was that it would be Wait a second. Oh, crap ass. I'm not using a different X. No. It's a different A. That if you changed your this A to something slightly different, you could just use this term and it'd work fine. That's what he did. He said, what if we had a different A? Which, when I write it like that, just sounds so stupid. Like, ah, well, what if we just use a different coefficient in that spot? Like, uh, I guess. <laughs> sure. Um, most of the really clever ideas, when you look at them from the right direction, seem really stupid. Um, yeah, so never, never, um, or maybe the message there is never discount an idea that seems silly because it might actually be cleverer than you think. Only really clever people can be stupid in just the right way. What is it in the Hitchhiker's Guide? People try and make things completely foolproof, but they always underestimate the ingenuity of complete fools. <laughs> okay. So what Taylor did is he went, well, that A4 would have been figured out like this, the fourth derivative at zero on four factorial. And what Taylor did is he went, well, what if we just used a different number in that spot there. My new A4 
you put a different number in that spot for some other sky. I'm just going to put that together. But that's the idea. He went, what if we had a different coefficient and the different coefficient is going to be figured out by putting a different number in this spot just here. Instead of using the center that I was using before, I will use some other number instead. But not just any other number. Something that's between the x I was thinking of and zero. That at least narrows it down a bit. So this is the actual theorem. It goes... So when you... Um, we have Pnx is the Taylor polynomial for f of x at c... Damn it. Um, and E N X is its error. So if you go this plus this, you end up with the actual function. Then for each X, there is a psi between X and C. So that the error is the nth plus oneth derivative of your function figured out at the number psi divided by n plus one factorial times x minus c to the n plus one. It's n plus one because I went to the next one after the cube to get the fourth one. It's the next one after where you were up to. And in case you were wondering how I pronounce this letter, if you weren't paying attention, it is pronounced, the name of this letter is Psi. No, it is Psi. <laughs> Some people pronounce it Z, sure, whatever. Do what you like. Honestly, say something that doesn't sound like any of the other letter names and it'll be fine. Um, but um, I pronounce it this way because in Greek, it makes a kus sound, same as our X does. And I pronounce this letter pi, so it has to rhyme. So There you go. And if you'd like to know how I draw it, I almost always never draw it exactly the same, but the capital psi is this and a lowest case psi is made by joining them together one two three <laughs> yay yeah. most people the only reason i have found for a mathematician to use the letter psi is because they're proud of being able to handwrite it <laughs> but to be fair it's like a fancy X, right? Um, most places in the world use a Z for that number in that spot. And in at least one of the Mobiuses this year, they asked you to put a Z in that spot. And if you go back to, nine, to, to 2018, it was a Z. Who were, you know, the person who wrote your notes for um, Maths 1B Calculus just likes the letter psi, I think. Yep. I know this is getting to a uh, spot where you're not too familiar with uh, exam, but if I was just to write at the top of a question where I was dealing with this, like psi equals z, would that be okay? Because I use that. It is 100% okay to use any other letter that you like in this spot. Because you can just say the error is this for some z between the center and x like because in maths technically you're allowed to use whatever letters you want there's nothing stopping you using x for the name of a function other than just knowing that everyone will freak out but nothing stopping you so it is totally okay for you to use the letter z in that spot because ev even if you are using psi 
you always have to put the statement in for some psi between x and c. And so since that statement is always there, that is telling you what that letter stands for, and you can use whatever letter you like. But I would recommend a Z because it's traditional. Yeah, so go for it. And in fact, no one has suggested that, and I love it. Yeah, up until now. So, yeah. Uh, the literal words between X and zero or X and C. You can't use a less than sign because you don't know which side it's on. Yes, you could say that. Uh, you could theoretically say the modulus of. Uh, yeah, you could say that the distance between psi and c is less than the distance between x and c, like which means psi is closer to c than x is. You could say that if you wanted. Yeah. <laughs> Let us talk about that. That is really important. We've talked about some technical details of the physical writing and grammar of this. And that's important. But let's talk about what it means. And I'm going to talk about, I'm going to draw a quick squiggly graph and then I may possibly go over Desmos, but we'll have a look. We'll see. Was it green before the, the, the polynomial was green? Yeah. There's my C. So, oh, before I forget, thank you. You've done a good job. You've made my job easier. I really appreciate the questions and the comments. So before I forget to say it, thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right. So here we are at X. And this is the error just here. Just there. So this is okay. What the theorem is saying is that if I drew another graph. Here. And these are all my options for what psi is. So all these different options for psi between here and here. E3 is this high. That's how high E3 is. E3 of x. And if I draw the function, I'm running out of colors, people. If I draw the function on this zone, that is um, this function, whatever the hell that looks like, I don't know. Uh, maybe it looks like that then there will be at least one answer here, one psi here somewhere that is the correct answer for, that is the answer for E, 3x. Yep. 
So if I go look, think about all the options for Kasai between here and here, at least one of them will be the right answer for the error. Don't know which one. Don't know how many there will be, but I know there will be one. Mm. There are many, many theorems. If you ever do um, a course about the um, theory of uh, calculus, um, it's called real analysis. If you ever do a course about the theory of calculus, there will be many theorems of this type that say there is some number between here and here such that thing happens. There are lots of them. Um, yeah. Anyway. So there is a lot we do not know. We do not know how many of these there are. We don't know which is the right one um, because we don't know what this is. We're imagining that this exists, but we don't know what it is. But we do know that one of these is the right one. So therefore, it can't be any worse than this one. That's the tallest error that is possible based on all the size that I calculate. One of them is right, but I don't know which one. And so this is the worst one, so it can't be any worse than that. That's the idea behind bounds for errors. You say, well, it's one of the size. This is what all the answers are for all the size, and this is the biggest one. So it's got to be less than that. That's how it works. Um, you... That's a good question. How do you go about the maximums in the middle? That's the question just for the recording. Um, and the answer is, if it was in the middle and it was a very nice function and you knew it was exactly in the middle, that'd work because it was a quadratic. Um, or if you happen to know something very useful about your function such that it's, you know, for example, that you don't know where the maximum is, but it's definitely less than one because it's sine, then you just pick one. So that's the other thing. If you don't know exactly where the maximum is, but you do know it's depth, you can pick something that's a bit bigger and it's got to be better than that. So let's do an example, hey? Because that's the most, that's the easiest way of dealing with this. Did I just say 11 twice on my page numbers? I did, I started going backwards. You can tell a bit, we've, we've been doing this for a while now. Okay. Pale polynomial of degree two. Used to approximate sine of three X at and center. Meh. Do I use zero just to make it easier on ourselves or do I use one that's not zero just to make it? No. Not zero? Okay. Sure. Taylor polymer of degree two and center pi on two is used to approximate sine three X at X equals pi on six. Yeah. No one would do this. But as I said, it's play, right? If we can do this, we can do anything. Find an upper bound. For the error. Okay. Now, questions can be asked in multiple ways. As long as all the words are there, it should be okay. Um, and it's the prepositions that tell you what goes with what. So it's an of degree. Um, so the, you, they might not say center. They might just say at. And this at goes with a different at. Like to the, the at that goes with the Taylor polynomial is different to the at that goes with the position at which you're approximating. They're probably going to write it much clearer than I did uh, because at least one person checks the exam to see if it makes sense. So, um, yeah. So write an upper, find an upper bound for the error. Okay, so I know that the error 
is made from the second I need the second derivative to figure out the degree two Taylor polynomial, which means I need to use the third derivative to find the error. I have to go one step further than I would to figure out the Taylor polynomial. So I'm just going to actually write that thinking. Um, uses up to the second derivative. So therefore the error uses the third derivative because it's the next one after. It's the n plus one. So I'm gonna need third derivative. Okay, so f of pi on two is sine, just a second. We need the derivatives first. I'm not following my own advice, just a second. f of x is sine of three x. And so f dash of x is three cos of three x. And f double dash of x is nine minus nine. That's right, the three came. Yep, okay. And the third derivative would be so the co derivative of cos has a minus sign. Derivative of sine stays as a plus cos, but it was already a minus, so that's okay. So here okay, we're good. Here we are. Now if I was finding a Taylor polynomial, I would sub in zero into all of these to figure out what the coefficients were. But they haven't asked me to actually find the Taylor polynomial, so I won't do that. To find the error, I need to sub in something other than zero into this spot. I have to sub in my letter psi or z if you prefer. So error number three, not number two, sorry, it goes with the second Taylor polynomial. I know you use the third derivative, but it belongs to the second Taylor polynomial. So you put a two there. Error number two at x is therefore minus 27 cos of three psi on uh, three factorial because it was the third derivative that I used times x minus pi on two because that's the center to the three because it was the third derivative. So just pointing out that this three and this three and this three, they're all the same. Okay. And this three, right? The third derivative. Okay. Just to check that I've done it right, I'm so the sort of person who put the wrong number on one of those. So it's a nice thing to stop and say, are all my numbers the same? Yes, okay. Sweet. It's not pretty. But here we are. I guess three factorial six, I could technically cancel out some 20, like divide this by three and I'd have nine on two. Oh, crap. Just a second. For some psi between x and pi on 2. You have to put that sense statement in somewhere along the line here. You have to tell them what the psi stands for. Or the z. So you asked before, you could literally put a z here, here, and here, and it would be okay. Yeah, okay. Right. We would like to know what E2 of pi on 6 is, because that's the point I'm doing the error at. E2 of pi on 6. Pi on six and pi on two. All right, doing well. So, I mean, I can calculate. No, well, no, no, I can't, but you know, we'll go. Okay.
Um, my favorite fraction fact is that a, a third plus a, like a, the difference between a third and a half is a sixth. And so this is minus pi on three. Hmm. You may not have a favorite fraction fact. My favorite fraction is three eighths, but um, my favorite fraction fact is that the difference between a half and a third is a sixth. Yep. It's the number of liters of milk in, in um, um, every 100 grams of 200 grams of Capri dairy milk chocolate. <laughs> 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 um, here you go. See, isn't that a great answer? <laughs> it's also just a little bit less than half. I really like fractions that are just a bit less than half. Um, yeah. Mainly because it's fun to give that answer. So, yeah. My favorite number of all is 65,536, but that's a whole other story. So, um, okay. So, Ask me about it one day after your exam. Okay. So, okay. Um, okay. So the thing is, usually when they say an upper bound for the error, they're implicitly saying that they want the size of the error, not whether it's positive or negative. They They haven't explicitly said it, but they almost always really want the absolute value of the error. So I'm just going to chuck that in. So any negative signs just disappear. But I also have no control over whether cos of 3 psi is positive or negative, so I need to keep the, the um, absolute values there. I guess I could move the 9 on 2 out. So the size of this is controlled by um, cos of 3 psi. But cos of anything is always less than 1. So, you know, the absolute value of cos of 3 psi is less than or equal to 1 for any psi. And so, therefore, the error to is less than or equal to nine on two pi on three cubed, which is actually quite a big number because um, pi on three is a bit more than one. Um, and so when you do a power of three, it's even more than more than one and nine on two is four and a half. So my error is better than like five. That's what calculators are for. But honestly, that's a good answer. I'd stop there. So we haven't even got whole number accuracy yet. Maybe it's within the nearest 10, which is sad because cos of 3x three, three is always less than 1 anyway. So the, my error is within 10 of something that's less than 1. It's great. Fabulous. But that is how this works, right? If your distance between your, if the distance between the thing that you're calculating um, and the center is more than one, then the error is just bad. Or could be bad. We don't know. Yeah. What's that? I did not. I said this entire thing is less than one. And so I replaced that with a one, like there's a... I replace the whole thing of cos of 3 psi with 1. I could possibly be slightly more accurate if I wanted, knowing that cos of 3 psi between pi on 6 and pi on 2 is a uh, probably, I don't know, decreasing or increasing, but it's not worth the effort. Yeah. There you go. That's whatever part of the 
just decide to what then you look to something. something. And it's Yep, I'm going to repeat that because it's a nice summary. Take whatever part of the function involves psi and say it's less than or equal to something and plug that number in. So just, just as another example, Taylor polynomial for e to the x um, at center... Zero. Oh, so that would be Maclaurin polynomial. That would have been easier to say. That's all right. Um, of degree five, um, put e to the x at center zero, um, a bound for the error. using this to approximate one on E squared. No. One on root E. Let's do it. So a Taylor polynomial of degree five for E to the X at center zero, um, find a bound for the error using this this to approximate one on root e. Okay. So let f of x be equal to e to the x. Um, one on root e is e to the minus a half, which is f of minus a half. So that is the number that we're subbing in for our x later. Now, we know definitely what the Taylor series is for e to the x, and it's like x to the n over n factorial, but that does not help at all to figure out the error. Unfortunately, you cannot figure out the error from an existing Taylor series. You have to do the derivatives to find the error because the derivative formula involves subbing an unknown number psi into the formula for the derivative. And the derivatives lost in that final Taylor series with the sum notation in it, you haven't got it anymore because it's turned into numbers. And so there's no way around it. I'm just going to have to find the derivative. But that's okay because all the derivatives of e to the x are the same. So I don't wow. have to figure them out separately. So that's great. That's a property of e to the x. So I can just skip that bit of the working. And so the error number six of x is going to be, oh crap, we need the sixth one, don't we? We need the sixth derivative to do the error for the fifth Taylor polynomial. What's that? Thank you. <laughs> Where was I? Okay. I need the sixth derivative. At, I'm gonna use z this time. I'm tired of writing size. The sum z between x and zero. And I know that I could sub in the minus a half here already at the beginning. That's totally possible, but I just feel better doing it this way. Some z between minus a half and zero. Ah. Okay. Well, sure. So that would be e to the z. I guess that's one on two to the six, isn't it? A half to the six. Cool. That's a perfectly good positive number, actually. So I don't have to worry about the absolute value because it works out the same anyway.
Well, I hope the irony is not lost on you. To figure out the error in calculating e to the x, I need to know what e to the x is. That's hilarious, um, personally. Um, okay, but that's okay. Let's figure it out. It's just great. Um, so let's imagine here's zero. No, here's zero and here's minus a half. And what does e to the x look like? It looks like this. That's e to the z for all the possible z's that we could choose. The highest one of those is one. So I can say e to the z is increasing for z between minus a half and zero. So the maximum value is e to the zero, which is one. Coincidence that it's one. The other one was also one. Coincidence. Um, and so therefore, E6 minus a half is less than or equal to 1 over 6 factorial times 2 to the 6. Which is a really quite small number. Yep. Oh, it is the, it is the fifth error. Thank you. And I have to go all the way back to that. And you said that earlier. And... I um, didn't pay attention at the time. Right. It's the fifth error because it goes with the fifth degree polynomial, but we use the six. Excellent. You know, I gave advice earlier and I didn't listen to it. I'm just like Alice. From Alice in Wonderland. She has a whole song about it in the film. Okay, cool. So let me, I just, I, I have to know. Um, I know what six factorial is, it's 720. Oh, I do actually, it's um, 64. All right, so we've got two times 10 to the minus five. That's um, five, four decimal place accuracy. Like five times 10 to the power of minus N is five times 10 to the power of minus N plus one is N decimal places accuracy. So yeah, there you go, cool. Um, yeah, I probably should have done that back here, maybe. This one was a positive number anyway, so I sort of didn't bother, but yeah, the modulus is best. So because this is a positive number, I actually know um, that the, um, but before I did the modulus, because this is definitely positive, um, that means that I have to add a positive number to get to the real value. So the, the Taylor polynomial is lower than the correct answer. So not that that really matters, but it's just worth noting, I guess. Well, there are four minutes to go. It is time for people to say or ask anything while we're at it. Yep. Hi. What about big O notation? I don't know if you need it. <laughs> um, my instinct is that they sort of mention it in passing, right? A couple of times. They didn't ask you to do anything on it in any of the assignments. So my instinct based on that <laughs> is that they're unlikely to appear to a great extent in the exam. But the short version is that a polynomial of degree n, like if your error the 
this way. If your error has an x to the power of 6 in it, then it's big O of big O of h to the 6 or um, x to the 6. Yep. Okay. Why is your effect not your effect not work? It's been getting at me since you've said it. You can just instead of telling us all the bits we have. Okay. I'm going to stop the recording. Are we going to ask the other one? Don't just say that. Well, um, I, I will say.